Wilson, 1960s. Here come the judge. Here come the judge. Here comes the judge. That's a funny thing on a situation comedy. It's a funny thing when you're engaged in watching a variety show like Rowan and Martin's Laughing. But how many of you know, friends, it's not a funny thing in the church of Jesus Christ. A young man in Manhattan, New York, goes for an interview, and he was from, actually I said earlier it was Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, I was corrected, he was actually from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, and this guy was an MIT graduate, and he was a genius, and somebody reminded me, he's heard the story before, it was a different place, and so he goes for an interview, and there's this woman who's interviewing him, and says, so, Tell me a little bit about yourself. I noticed you are from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. He says, yeah, that's right. And let me tell you, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada is known for two things. And she says, young man, what are the two things? The world's greatest hockey players and the ugliest women in the world. Could he be in trouble? Who knows? Let's see. She says, young man, I'll have you know I am from Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, um, what hockey team did you play for? <laughs> At two in the morning when you get this, you'll be rolling on the floor. <laughs> People don't want to be judged. Who cares what people want? God doesn't want people to be judged when it comes to their heart. We're, supposed to, we're never supposed to judge uh, a person's heart because guess what? Only God is qualified to judge a person's heart. Now you might say, I don't struggle with this and I just want to bless you, my children, bless you. Because there's times I have a problem. I might see a person sitting on the streets of San Jacinto, or maybe not Paris, but certainly Hemet, and I may make a judgment of their heart as to why they are in that situation, why they're in that condition. And I could be wrong. Spoiler alert. I'm not going to finish this message today. I'm not going to promise to finish it next week, but good chance I will. So for those of you who don't get all your notes filled in, it's okay. It gives you something to doodle with, and next week we'll give you a whole new fresh piece of paper. We're to judge somebody not by their heart, but by what? Who can tell me? By their... Tim, yell it. That's yelling? <laughs> by their track record. You see, when you judge someone's motives, their intentions, or their heart, guess what you're doing? You're saying, Lord, nice throne. Let me kick you off. Let me sit down and let me do the judging. This includes your own children. You can judge a child's track record and say, honey, you're not, you're not cleaning your room. You haven't cleaned your room in, well based on the fungus and the molds and the rats, it's, it's been a while, and we just saw Moses walk out the back door, so it's been a while since you've cleaned your room. Here are the consequences if you don't clean your room. That's a track record. To say, you know what? You don't care about your mother! That's called a little Jewish guilt, or if you're from Catholic background, Catholic guilt, if you will. You don't love me! You don't know what you're doing to me! And it's that guilt. You're judging a child's heart. And it might not even be what you're saying, or it might be what you're saying. When you, when, when you judge people's hearts, you will go through great pain. How many of you have learned that when you judge your child, when you judge a spouse, when you judge a parent, when you judge an employer or employer, when you judge a neighbor, when you judge somebody in church, how many of you, like me, it ultimately fills your heart with pain? How many of you have ever judged somebody and it felt so good? You dirty, rotten scoundrel! You are lower than a snake's belly in a wagon wheel rut. Let me tell you something. And, and you kind of feel good because you get it off your chest. Then you walk away and you go, I forgot one thing. I have to see that person again. I'm married to him. It's my kid. 
And he's only four months old. He'll be around for years to come. When you judge a person, it will destroy your marriage. It'll push your kids away. Listen to me now. Come here. I want you to come here right now. Often a parent will judge a child. And all of a sudden, the child becomes an adult. And we've never developed a relationship with that child based on the fact that they will mature. And they'll be an adult. And then they repel us like two magnets. And they don't want anything to do with us. And we feel so hurt. And we're in such pain. But like I said with the kids today, people want to go where they're celebrated, not where they're tolerated. You can want to help a person and help bring a person to wholeness and want to see them conformed into the, or transformed into the glorious image of Christ, but the second you judge the heart, there is something through sarcasm and cynicism and pessimism and a religious spirit returning to bondage where all of a sudden this child as an adult wants nothing to do with you anymore. The prodigal son had an older brother and he got in big trouble. At the end of the parable, his father, who is God, and his brother, who's the people on the streets who come into the church and fall in love with Jesus Christ, and the older brothers, the church people, as the church people, come on. You are too. We have to be careful of this. And we see someone come in, oh, they're only coming to the church for the food. They're only coming to the church because, you know what, they, 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 they haven't even repented of their sins. They're just coming here for the different things we're doing for them or for the money. You're judging the heart. You don't know that. And here's what happens. At the end of the parable, the kingdom of God, or the, the, the father's house, rather, is the kingdom of God. It's eternal life. And at the end, the older brother who judges his brother's heart is on the outside looking in. Because inside of my father's house, there is no judgment. Only the father can judge. And there's this great white throne, and that's a judgment you'll never go through. And there's another one where the only thing that's going to be judged, I'll tell you about this next week or the week after, is going to be what you've done for him. It's going to be the gifts you get. It's going to be the great stuff and the positive thing, but it has nothing to do with eternal life. But the prodigal son, he judged his father's heart. You never gave me a party, and you never did this, and you love my brother more. Your heart's wicked, Dad. And that brother, righteous living, a fornicator, a drug addict, he broke the kosher laws, he didn't honor God, and he didn't do the things he was supposed to do. I've been a godly man. Religion, returning to bondage, never changes. But so often, some of us right now, we're still judging mom and dad. And based on their track record, there are things that might have been wicked or twisted, might have been wrong. But how many of you know, until you think of mom and dad as being on, the planet, on planet Earth, here they are, and here's the things they did that really hurt you, the pain. But now you want to soar into places you've never been. You want to go to places that have never been available to you. But you can't defy gravity. You cannot make your way into the purposes of God and be seated in a higher place with Christ Jesus in heavenly places until you say, Mom, Dad, it's under the blood. Jesus has got this thing. No matter what you did, I love you. I forgive you. But they don't deserve it. Huh. Can you tell me anything you've ever been forgiven of that you deserved? That I deserved? I told you I use this line all the time. Somebody came up to me one day and said, Pastor, you really hurt my feelings, and you did this, and what you did was wrong. And I kind of thought about it. It probably was wrong. It probably was. And I said, you know what? I think somebody died for that. I think somebody died for that. I don't know about you, but... I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I love being forgiven. And I'm going to know with my personality, I really need it. I'm one of the guys, some of you want Park Place when you play Monopoly and Boardwalk. Some of you want to have as many hotels as you can. With my personality, I need, guess what? All the get-out-of-jail-free cards I can get. And we're going, but you don't deserve it! Listen, bucko, do you deserve it? I don't deserve it. The Bible tells me all have sinned except for Chaz Fisk. He's a sweetheart. 
and he cooks great meals. Plus, you know, the guy who cooks could poison you. You've got to give him a break here, okay? All have sinned except for Chaz, no, including Chaz, and have fallen short of the glory of God. Hmm. I do believe that we do need to judge people's fruit because what's the scripture? What's the scripture I'm going to use? You will know a tree by its fruit. Very good. Don't marry someone until you know their track record. How many of you have ever been in a relationship where you could have done your due diligence? <laughs> I remember this from my law school days. You could have, and if, you're, if that person's with you now, shame on you. Don't raise your hand, okay? But if, how many of you have ever married somebody where, come to think of it, I should have had a V8, you know? I, I, I should have done my due diligence, and I should have checked their track record. I dated a gal before Marge, and right now, watch me, watch me, watch. Bzz! What did I do? Bzz! Oh, you're so good. I dodged a bullet. It would have been, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But then came Marge. Ain't she sweet? See, you're walking down the street. Man, just oozes out Jesus. Whole different agenda. See, when you get saved, here's some good news, because some of you are saying, Pastor, I don't judge hearts. I just judge track records. I just judge fruit. Thank you, Oprah Winfrey. That's great. That's Oprah's thing. I'm not, not anti-Oprah. I think she's got some good things to say. But you see, here's the problem. Oh, don't go moan and groan at me. But anyway, here's the thing. When you get saved, before you judge somebody, you want some good news? You want some good news today? Denise can't handle this, but you can handle it. You can't handle the truth. You ready for this now? You ready for this? When you get saved, you get a new track record. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'm going to make them white as snow. Forgiveness. Bobby G, you sound like a guy who plays a clarinet and has got some skills there. Isn't that exciting? I don't know about you, man, but how many of you were like me? When you got saved, you really needed to get saved. By the way, that's all of us. That's all of us, Marie. That's all of us, Maria. All of us, Marie. Every one of us. When you get saved... The Bible says, well, let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm going to use a different version today. What this means is, 2 Corinthians 5.17, those who become Christians become new persons. Have you ever seen a person get radically born again and they're just different? They are not the same anymore. For the old life is... What's that? Great job. Go on. And I like it. What springs forth? A new life has begun. How many of you could raise your hand today and say there was a time in your life, forget about where you're at today, that Jesus did something marvelous in your life? Raise your hand. Marvelous. Marvelous. So I have a question to ask you. Next time you judge somebody's intentions, their motives, their hearts, can we have enough faith to believe that God has the power. He's all-powerful, right? And God has the knowledge. He's all-knowing. And he has the flexibility. He's everywhere, omnipresent. Do you have the faith to believe that God can work in that person's life who irritates the dickens out of you the same way he's worked in your life? This is preparing your heart for communion today. As I said, we're not going to get very far, but we're going to get real far for today. People often say someone is spiritual or they have a good heart. And we don't even know them yet. We've not even inspected their track record. There's one thing I directed a play called Love Came Down, and we're not here to dig for dirt. We don't want to be dirt diggers. We're not looking to bust somebody, but we want to be able to verify. Always trust, Ronald Reagan said, but verify. That's good. So here's a big idea. We are never called to judge what only God can judge. Many of you probably know I have my doctorate. And so if any of you, you know, I know some of you are going to Mexico for surgery to save a little bit of money. I get that. But I'd like to volunteer to do your surgeries moving forward. 
whether it's brain surgery, heart surgery, prostate's not my thing, but um, I'd be more than happy. Uh, if, if there's any cancer, I'll cut it out for you. Um, uh, right now, I'm on a low budget, so you'll have to forgive me that I can't use any anesthetic right now. So you'll just have to trust me. I'll give you a piece of rubber to bite on, and let's just trust God that the pain will be mitigated, okay? But I'd like to offer to do, how many of you would agree that if you need brain surgery, maybe you should go to a competent brain surgeon? Heart surgery? And I'm here to say that many of us are practicing medicine without a license. Because there's only one person I know who can cut sin out of another person's life. There's only one person I know who doesn't want to do plastic surgery. That's just external. That's just outward appearance. But he wants to do something internal like create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. But we have a lot of incompetent physicians in the church who are not physicians. We are like little children who dress up. My, 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 I think it's my grandson Lincoln has a shirt with a stethoscope on it. Isn't that Lincoln? And he pretends he's a doctor. Isn't that cute when they're three? But if he still wears that shirt, at 25 years old, I'm taking him over my knee and I'm going to use an electronic spoon. Because <laughs> we have a problem then. One of the reasons that churches, I want you to hear this now. Linda, we've talked about this before and you work with the little children and Rick and they do a great job and we appreciate all you do. <clears throat> but one of the reasons that churches do not attract the unchurched, and that's what we're about to do, guys, is not that the unchurched do not want God. If there's something that Pastor Steve Norman did well here, he knows how to attract the unchurched. And I value that, and I celebrate you for that, brother. And that's a passion. And that's my passion, too. And he's a gift to this house. Rose is more of a gift, but Marge is more of a gift, too. That's just how it goes, buddy. You know, and uh, Tricia... No, I think Chaz is the bigger gift there. You know, uh, no, he's taller than you. He's taller than you, so he's a taller gift. No, I mean, man, we love gifts. We love to celebrate one another. But you see, here, here, here's what I want you to hear today. It's not that the world out there does not want God. They do not want judgmental people. If you believe that, can you say amen? amen. No, I need a bigger amen. amen. I mean, this is important you hear this. It doesn't mean, some of you are thinking, great, great to have Wolfson at the helm right now. We're just going to have a whole bunch of bona fide grade A sinners in this place, and it's just going to be a real liberal, feel-good, motivational seminar church. How many of you think that's probably not true? <laughs> we are never called to judge what only Dr. God, the great physician, Dr. Jesus, can judge. One of the reasons, guys, I want you to see this, or I mentioned that, but let me, let me tell you something. Give me an example of how we can be as church people. A young man in Wheaton, Illinois, he's going to Wheaton College, the school that Billy Graham has his museum at, uh, he was in the process uh, of wanting to raise money for his tuition. And he realized, who remembers the days when you could collect bottles, even beer bottles, and pop bottles, and you can get a nickel for each bottle? Any, any of you go back that far? Of course, it's not called pop if you're from the East Coast. Did you know that, Mike? It's called soda. Because on the East Coast, they don't know how to talk. But anyway, <laughs> they're phenomenal. And so anyway, so he knocks on the door of a Christian woman and says, ma'am, I'm going through school right now, and I need to raise some money, and I'm wondering, um, I, take, I take the bottles, any kind of bottles you have here, I take them, and I, and I go to the recycle place, and I get a nickel per bottle. So is there any chance you have any beer bottles? And she looked at him and said, young man, what kind of woman do you think I am? Can you see the joy of the Lord? I am a born again, spirit filled Christian. And let me tell you right now, I would never drink beer. I am insulted. That kind of person. No, I have no beer bottles. This guy was taken back and he looked at her. Figured, what kind of bottles would a woman like this have? He said, Do you have any vinegar bottles? We don't want to look like we've been baptized in vinegar. We don't want to look like instead of wine or grape juice, we use vinegar for communion. 
Puts the pucker back in the lips, if you will. Here are some more wisdom points on judging, and I want to ju- we're just going to cover two of them today. Plan on covering five of them, but I don't want to. Here it is. Wisdom point number one. Our, let's say it together, and then write it down. Our track record is all that anyone really knows about us. Listen to me now. Listen to me. Rick Burnham's a pretty laid-back guy. He's a pretty quiet guy. Great actor, by the way. Great actor. And we're thinking of bringing him back into the play now, and he's getting scared. He's, He's chewing his gum faster all of a sudden. But you know what? I don't know Rick's heart. That's why I'm thankful that Denise is a prophetess. So she's told me, oh, his heart, Pastor. I've known him for years. And then she said, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. She didn't do that. She's a godly woman. She's telling her loved ones right now, Pastor's lying, Pastor's lying. What's new? But anyway, but I know Rick's track record. Rose, when we're doing a play, you know, I don't have to call Ghostbusters. I got Rick to make the sets. When I need somebody to stand in the gap when it comes to doing a play, I've got Rick. When it comes to somebody to continuously change, I don't know if you've ever seen the themes that he does on an ongoing basis upstairs for the children's ministries. This guy just hits a grand slam every time. So I'm thinking he's got a pretty cool heart, a pretty tender heart, a pretty happening heart, but I don't know. Because I don't even know my own heart. The Bible says the heart is, above all else, deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? People come up to me, Pastor, don't judge my heart. I'm not, because I'm not even judging mine. Don't miss this today. This is your, what, your message. So our track record is all that anyone really knows about us. Even your parents don't know your heart. How many of you ever, now I had great parents, man. They weren't even Christians, but they were awesome parents. How many of you ever had a parent say to you, you know what, you don't love me, or you don't care about me, or you did that on purpose, or how many of you ever had that kind of experience with a parent or a spouse or somebody else? But you'll know a tree by its fruits. By its fruit, that's singular. As long as you are patient, here's some great news. What is in a person will eventually come out. There's a song about it from 75 years ago in the Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Come out, come out, wherever you are. It'll come out. You can't suppress it. It is there. Now, pressure and stress has a way of bringing the real person out. How many of you have ever been tired? I don't mean now. Wake up. No, you've been tired, real tired, and you said something you didn't mean. Come on, come on, come on. Can I bum you out? You meant it at the time. I meant it at the time. I meant it at the time. A lot of times we say they don't mean it, but you remember I told you this before, when there was this little girl, um, you know, she, um, she, she, um, she spit on her friend Susie. And her mother said, Susie, admit it. When you spit on your friend right there, Sweetheart, you, it was the devil that made you do it. That's right, Mom. It was the devil. But kicking her was my own idea. I think you know what I mean. Here's what I'm, I've learned. Pressure and stress has a way of bringing the real person out. There's times I've been exhausted, so I can't fake it. <laughs> There's times I've been really irritated. I've been really wounded. I've been really hurt. And then all of a sudden, I can say I didn't mean it, but I did mean it. But that's okay, guys. Don't beat yourself up. I've got some good news today. Now, listen to this statement I wrote, and this is one I know I got from the Lord. Wonderful people in the midst of the storm stay wonderful. Wonderful people in the midst, what a wonderful world it would be. They stay wonderful. Trisha, when we first moved to Tacoma, I believe you were seven, and you had a best friend named Rochelle, who we're praying for right now in the name of Jesus. She has a surgery that's coming up, and this could be a very serious, with her eye, and this could be a very serious situation. Her husband says we can pray for it. I asked his permission, just so you know that. 
But here's what I want you to know. She was eight. And this girl is like our Ida. Ida, I should bring you up here so we can teach people how to smile. But Ida, I'm going to tell you right, would you agree Rochelle and Ida probably have two of the most infectious smiles in the world? I mean, unbelievable. And she's so positive. She's a godly woman. And she's going through it now. And I asked her husband, how's your wife doing in the midst of the storm? He said, Pastor, she's nervous, but she has such peace. You know her. She's a Jesus girl no matter what. Isn't that a cool thing to say? Isn't that a cool thing to believe? Wonderful people in the midst of the storm stay wonderful. Now, if you feel that's not you, I'm a little bit like you. I'm not so wonderful. And so I need to work on that area. And we need to work on that together. So here it is. Wisdom point number two. You got to get this one. Remember I talked about surgeons? Scalpel. Get your knife out. It's important you get this one today. Trying to fix others will bring pain into their lives as well as yours. Trying to fix others will bring pain. You got to hear this today. Because I'm going to show you a new way of living that takes the pressure off of you and puts it on Abba, Papa, Father God. It's really cool. There are two kinds of people who try to fix others. How many of you have anybody in your family, don't look to the left or the right, who sometimes try to fix you? Raise your hand. How many of you ever had a guy, a gal, trying to fix you? Trisha, Chaz, raise your hand. We've been trying, Mom and I have been trying to fix you guys since day one, really. It gets you to make more meals for us. But they're wonderful. How many of you have, come on. You guys, Ronnie, have you ever, not all of us grew up like you, perfect, but my question is, have you ever had someone try to fix you? Oh, I got a list of names of people that would like to fix you right now. Do you mind if I just take a moment? I digress. There are two kinds of people who try to fix others. Write it down. Mean-spirited people who love to cast the first stone. What did Jesus say? He who's without sin cast the first stone. I know this is terrible to bring this up right now, especially on live, but, um, you know, the story's told, and don't tell this in a Catholic church. How many of you grew up Catholic? Those of you who grew up Catholic will appreciate this. Well, you know, there was a woman caught up in adultery, and she's there, and everyone's got stones. Who remembers the story? They're about to have a rock concert and throw the stone at her. And Jesus said, you should know this one there, my great Lamare. He said, he who is without sin, let him cast the stone. And all of a sudden, a stone came through and hit Mary Magdalene on the side of the head and knocked her down dead. And Jesus looked and said, Mother. Because what do the Catholics teach? That Mary was without sin. I love Catholic people. But I got a story to tell you about a man named Jesus. He's our Lord and he's our Savior. He had a mother. She sinned like you, and sinned like me as well. The key is, guys, she was not without sin. And so often, no, that didn't really happen for those of you wondering. Okay, mean-spirited people love to cast the first stone. How many of you are church attenders? Well, no, how many of you have attended church for a while? Come on. How many of you have ever been in a church that when somebody screws up, it's time to have a rock concert? and throw. And they even cheat like the Houston Astros. Too soon. Anyway, but let's move on here. How many of you know... How many of you know did I say that publicly? Did I, I, I was thinking it, but I actually... I did have one? Okay, yeah, let's move on real quick. Well, then there's another kind of person that casts the first stone that's well... Mean, or who try to fix people, rather. Well-meaning people who cry as they try to take the splint... The, 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 the tree trunk out of their own eyes. How many of you think about this, man? You need heart surgery, a quadruple bypass, and the doctor walks in. You know what I'm saying? I love those commercials, man, where uh, they talk about good enough is not good enough. You know what I mean? Or okay is not good enough. How many of you have seen that commercial with the doctor? I, was that a Verizon commercial? I, I don't remember, whatever it is. And the guy walks in, and he's going to operate, and, and, and the gal says, is he a good doctor? Oh, yeah, he's okay. 
And then he walks in and says, guess who just got his medical license back? Sort of. Hey, are you nervous? Yeah, me too. You know, and he comes in there, and the guy's just a bumbling idiot. If you haven't seen the commercial, it is great. I want you to imagine you're having surgery. How many of you ever had surgery? You had surgery? And the doctor walks in, and he's got two tree trunks on his eyes. And he's going to do a Stevie Wonder surgery, you know? And he comes in there. Hey, don't worry. I do the feel method, the touch method. God leads me. We'd be a little concerned. Well, listen to this. The scripture shows us the danger of trying to fix people. See, the Bible says love will cover a multitude of sins. I don't try to fix people. I try to have a faith that works by love. I want to reach out to them with love, not with a self-righteous, self-centered, judgmental spirit. But scripture shows us the danger of trying to fix people. You've got to get this, especially if you have a pit bull. Uh, Proverbs 26, 17. Yanking a dog's ear. How many of you know that doesn't, doesn't start very well? Yanking a, dog's e- yanking a dog's ear is as foolish as interfering in someone else's argument. How many of you have like a pit bull or a German shepherd or a Doberman pincher? How many of you have a dog that's got teeth? Would you raise your hand? Friends, a chihuahua will do this. A terrier will do this. A Labrador retriever will do this. Watch. Have you ever tried to grab a mad dog by the ear? You'll get a big time bite. See, friends, here's the principle of that proverb. Most things are not your business. Most things are not my business. I'm going to illustrate here in a moment. Uh, in, in fact, it's like when a policeman tries to break up a fight between a couple. I have experience with this. We talked to our um, dear um, um, Bob Pebble, Peebles. I call him Pebbles because my phone calls him Pebbles. In fact, I, I'm literally on my phone because how many of you know when somebody comes up with pebbles, I think of Bam Bam, and then I think of the Flintstones. So I'm serious. I'm going to do this. Whenever Bob calls me on my phone, I'm going to do Flintstones, meet the Flintstones. I mean, it's just the way it goes. Peebles, pebbles, you know, it's all begins with P. But anyway, so Bob said he's had this experience. It's like, there you are. Get over here. Bob, get over here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Now, guys, here's how it goes. When you see Bob do the Carol Burnett, pull his ear. There you go. But this, I'm telling the truth, though, aren't I? You, you've tried to break up a domestic violence thing. And did you ever have somebody try to hit you? Or, Yeah. And did I ask forgiveness? No, there you go. There you go. So a policeman tries to break up a fight between a couple. And what happens? All of a sudden, the couple, I hate you. I hate never. Well, let me tell you, woman, when you have a broom, you don't just use it for cleaning. It's your mode of transportation. I'm melting. You know what I'm talking about. That's a horrible situation. If you don't know that one, I have no hope for you. But all of a sudden, this is the weird thing. A policeman had told me this. My friend Andy Guerrero, who was a sheriff for years. Bob was a sheriff for years. All of a sudden, the couple get along. They have a new enemy. Bob has done them a favor. I hate you, my precious. You're a horrible wife. And they're fighting and they're arguing. But now it's like, ooh, new meat. Let's kill the policeman. Let's kill the policeman. And guys, I'm telling you the truth. It's like policemen are blown away. You were ready to kill her. And now you're killing me. It's no fair. You know, I had a couple I was counseling in Ontario, Oregon. And I don't say this to be culturally insensitive. I want you to know, this guy was so gracious. Japanese guy. A farmer. And just very stately and very, just a neat guy. Attended the church. And he was on his third marriage, and she was on her third marriage. So breaking up is hard to do. Actually, it was pretty easy. And uh, so they're, 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 they're together, and they're having marriage problems. I'm 22, fresh in the ministry, brand new. My pastor leaves me. He abandons me. I've got abandonment issues. He leaves me to go fishing with his boys in in, in Redfish, Idaho. I think that's the name of the place. And they're gone. 
We didn't have cell phones back in the olden days. It was like phones on the wall. It was weird. So I'm doing this marriage counseling. It's an emergency. So they're sitting on my authentic Naga Hyde couch in the office, and they're sitting there, and now remember those couches, if you bury your head in it when you're praying, you come up with black speckles all over your face, you know? You'd be like, oh, that's a disease. And so they're there, and all of a sudden, they get into a Donnybrook. I'm in a fight. And he calls her a name. I won't tell you what it is, but all I could say is it was like one of those dog names, you know, and it was ugly. And I'm 22, and I'm about to marry Marge in three weeks. And I'm going... Weren't they in love at one time? This is weird. I'm just trying to think of myself in that situation. And I mean, he calls her his name, and she hauls off and slaps him across the face. They don't teach you in seminary how to handle these things. <laughs> Eddie, I'm freaking out. And I'm glad there's a big desk between me and them. They look dangerous. And, and, and then... He jumps on her, and this cheap couch in my senior pastor's office goes literally on its, I don't know, it's not upside down, but it's 180 degrees, and there it is, and they're hitting each other, and I mean, when people are dumb and stupid, and they're just freaking out, they don't even fight, they fight like sissies, you know, and they're going, and they're just fighting. I said, Jesus, I need a word. Because if I get between them, I know it's going to happen to me. This is not a good thing. And I'm just thinking, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and so it was freaky. It was freaky deaky. So, uh, so finally, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm repenting. I'm much older than 22 now. I'm like almost 40. And I, I just got to mention to you, I'm at a place, I'm not suggesting you do this, but I think this was a God thing. I got the giggles. No, 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 no. I, I'm, Terry, I'm sorry. I, I got the giggles, Terry. And I just go, I'm trying to hold it in. But how many of you know when you try to hold the giggles in, it starts to come out your ears? No, it really, this is a thing. This, I can't tell you what scripture it is, but this is a thing. And I start to laugh, and I'm trying to hold the snot back in my nose, and I'm going, you know, oh, this is not good. And I just go... <laughs> And they stop. And they so properly, like Idaho farmers do, or Ida, they dust themselves off. And Denise, they just sit down like nothing happened. And he looks at me and says, whoa, 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 what is so funny? I said, you guys. If you could see yourself the way I see you, you guys look like nutcases. You look so stupid, guys. I'm, I didn't get in the fight. No, this actually shocked them. I think this laughter was holy laughter. I really do. And I said, it's just crazy. Thank you very much for your wise counsel. And she says, yeah, pastor, we're so sorry. I don't want you to think we act this way at home. I'm thinking at home it's knives, guns, and cannons, you know? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> and they left and filed for divorce the next week. They really did. But, guys, here it is. When two people have an issue and you meddle, you're going to end up right in the middle of it. See, the police, whether it's peoples or pebbles, they need to step in. They need to step in. That's okay. That's their job. But friends, that's when we need to pray and love. If you get involved in a conflict at work, how many of you have learned you're going to live to regret it? You're going to wish that you didn't. I've got to move on. Matthew 7, verse 3 through 5. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eyes when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't? Come on, you're a doctor. See past the log in your own eye. Then he says, you pretender. You actor. What's the word? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log from your own eye, because how many of you know Stevie Wonder doesn't do very well with the touch method with surgery? 
First get rid of the log from your own eye, then perhaps you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. But here's the notion of the scriptures you read in the Greek language. We will all have logs in our eyes when, it, when we try to judge somebody, when we try to read their heart, when we look at their motives, when we look at their intentions, when we look at the why behind the what, then logs instantly grow in our eyes because you see, we're not neurosurgeons. We're not cardiovascular surgeons. We were not, worship team, why don't you join me? Those that are serving communion, you can wait a couple minutes, but this is important. But Jesus is speaking so plain. He said, get rid of the log in your own eye, then perhaps you'll see well enough to deal with the speck. You guys aren't coming up yet? Okay. Um, we're, we're doing a new thing here, and I want to have a worship song before we start, so I want to make sure we remember that. Then perhaps you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eyes. Here's where Jesus is speaking plain. I want you to get this. You see a guy with a little speck in his eye. His problem. And you come out with the knife the surgeon's knife, and, and you have this big beam in your eye, if you will. What kind of surgeon would you be with a beam in your eye? Can you see that on Grey's Anatomy right now? No, I want to do a Saturday Night Live skit right here, man. Two big beams in your eye, but you're trying to judge the motive, the heart. The best thing you can do for a person who needs to be fixed, ready? Come here a second. Fix yourself. Fix yourself. I've learned that in my own life. This is a perfect example of how when we have a problem, we tend to go to people with the same beam in their eye that we have. Here's the example. I use it often. You know it, but it's important. How many of you have ever been with a person who has horrible breath that could stop a locomotive and they don't get it? And they're going to be offended. Imagine four guys. Bobby, come here. We're going to the Olive Garden, you and me. Yeah, sure. We're at the Olive Garden. And there's Bobby and I. Rachel, I need you over here. Rachel's going to have the pure breath. She's going to have the ruach of God. The breath of God. Oh, you're here. And here she is. And Bobby breathes on her. Get over here. Over here. You just kind of breathe. Okay, here. He goes. Oh, did you go to the Olive Garden yesterday? Confession's good for the soul. Okay, here it is. And all of a sudden, she thinks she's at a Benny Hinn crusade. She goes under the power. But it's not because of the Spirit of God. If I've offended you, guess what? That's your sacred cow. And I love to slaughter sacred cows. They make gourmet hamburgers. But anyway, so here she is. Come on in here so all your friends can see you in Australia. But anyway, so here we are. Can you move just a little bit, dude? I mean, you're bigger than a wolf's son. But anyway, so here we are. And she says, I don't mean to offend you, Bill, but... Your breath, it stinketh. It looks like it came out of Lazarus' tomb. It stinketh. And so I'm offended. Go stand over there. You offended me. And then I come over here. But Bobby and I ate with Bob. And we ate with Anthony. And we're the uh, BBB. No, no. Yeah, yeah, the BBBs. You know what the triple B is, right? The bad breath brothers. And so we, I mean, it's bad. And I say, man, dude, and you don't smell a thing because he ate those same raunchy breadsticks with all the butter and all the garlic. And he say, man, your breath lights up my life. Your breath, it is such a sweet savor unto the Lord. It is so fragrant. It is frankincense and myrrh to me, my brother. It's great. So we come over together to Rachel, the downer woman, who hurt her feelings. She was so insensitive and so mean-spirited. And we say, and she's going like, yeah, dude, this is sour. This is foul. There are demons in your mouth. I mean, it's horrible. But you see, here's what we do. Thanks, guys. Give them a round of applause, even though they don't deserve it, okay? Here's my point. If you have a problem, don't go to someone with the same struggle. Don't go to someone with the same problem. And we have a tendency to do that. Jesus is clear. People that have got beams growing out of their eyes can't fix other people. And the whole concept is the minute you try to fix them and judge them, you got beams in your eyes. So I got to finish. How many couples have tried to change each other only to bring pain 
into the other person's life. I didn't mention this in the first service. There's a very different message in the first service. <laughs> Marge really upset me early on in our marriage. Oh, she hurt my feelings. I, was, I, was, I couldn't tell you what it's about. And finally I said, honey, these are some things you need to change in your life. I am your husband. The household. And you need to realize God is speaking through me so you can change these things that will cater to my self-centered, egotistical, narcissistic, 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 I was speaking in tongues then, personality. <laughs> and Marge looked at me and said, you know, sweetheart, I am really close to Jesus and I don't really feel the need to have two Jesuses in my life. I'm really quite pleased with the way I'm turning out. And I absolutely love you. Please stop trying to fix me. Just embrace me. Hold me. And I put on Otis Redding's song. You got to hold her, squeeze her. Da, 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 da. I mean, it just changed our whole life together. When I realized I don't have to be the unholy ghost. And that's what I would be in Marge's life. See, here's what you want to know. Who wants to hang around people who are always trying to fix you? That's what the Bible teaches, friends. Uh, in fact, ladies, if you have a husband, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Can I give you a suggestion? If your husband does not have another man in his life that he's accountable to, that's an ugly situation and nothing but problems are going to happen. But you can't fix him. You can't fix him. He's that screwed up, just like you and just like me. Men, your wife wants to hear from you, that you love her, you're for her, you care. But how many of you ladies would agree you don't really, you, you lose that love and feeling when he's trying to fix you? Don't miss this. You see, friends, it takes the word of God to remove the speck in another person's eyes. So if you're a man of God, the Bible tells us to be in the word with our wife every day because the way she's cleansed is by the washing of the water of the word. The washing of the water of the word. I had an eye situation last night, uh, an allergic reaction. And you know what I've learned? Marge couldn't go in my eye and fix it. But I had this thing called clear eye. You see, the great surgeon is trained. He's competent. He's professional. Years ago, I was on the swim team, and they videotaped me to show me what was wrong with my technique. And I mean, I was into the breaststroke. And I was in it the year that Mark Spitz won seven gold medals in Munich, Germany. And they had moved from the frog kick to the whip frog the whip frog the whip and so they had me on video and it was so cool and then coach Contaldi showed me everything I was doing wrong the, your leg needs to come out three more degrees over here what are three degrees I get 180 I get 360 I get 90 but three degrees it was just so weird and he kept going all the, but he would show me the things I'm doing wrong he showed me my hands were slightly opened and the water wasn't being displaced properly it never helped me. But then he showed me video of Mark Spitz, a Jewish boy who went on to become a dentist. A Jewish boy who was in Munich, Germany, the year all those athletes were killed from Israel. And he showed me a picture of perfection. And I went, wow! I could see he's showing me Jesus. The picture, the right way to do it, the right method. We want to show our husband, our wife, our children. Let's show them Jesus. In fact, I'm going to show you a scripture on this right now. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And all of us have had that veil removed. So you can see now. I can see clearly now. Removed so that we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. And as the Spirit of the Lord works with in us, we become more and more 